Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst, the director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful, a wonderful event for you today on Ukraine's foreign policy, which will be kicked off by the foreign minister of Ukraine, Mr. Kuleba. Kuleba. Um, and we are doing this event in conjunction with the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, and with Chatham House. And Arisi Lutsevis of Chatham House will be our moderator and she will introduce our guests. Thank you. Over to you, Arisi. Thank you, John. Good day to all of us, uh, to all of you joining us from different corners of the world. Uh, I am managing Ukraine Forum at Chatham House, and paradoxically, this pandemic on one hand put us all in the isolation, but on the other, uh, as if the walls collapsed and we all feel in a way much closer right now. Definitely, I feel the walls of Chatham House collapsed. We're all working from home. So today we have an excellent panel put together by the Atlantic Council on the prospects for the resolution of conflict in Donbass. And it has been more than six years that this conflict is simmering in the center of Europe. In a way, it lasts longer than the Second World War when you think about it. And Russia wages a full spectrum warfare against Ukraine, regardless of Western pressure, regardless of Ukraine's own uh, as, um, effort to keep the enemy at bay. President Zelensky came to power uh, last year with a very strong promise to end the war. Uh, he has revived the Normandy meeting and we uh, had several meetings of the contacts group in Minsk. But the question is, what have we achieved so far? What is Ukraine's strategic position? What Ukraine is trying to uh, achieve? And today with us, we have um, an excellent panel and we will kick off with the um, introductory remarks from the new foreign minister, Kuleba, who is uh, quite young as a minister with less than one month in office, but he has been part of the diplomatic course from uh, 2003. He has served uh, as the Ukraine permanent representative to the Council of Europe from 2016. He has also been the deputy prime minister for European and Euro-Atlantic integration. He is an author of a very interesting book called The War for Reality, how to win in the world of fakes, truths, and communities. Other participants, I would like to introduce all of you at this point briefly, includes William Taylor, ambassador um, to Ukraine from 2006 and 9, but most um, recently in 2019, he served as chargé d'affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. It was a bit of a time travel, but these were interesting times. And I believe it's the first kind of public appearance of Ambassador Taylor after a very famous testimony he gave in the impeachment hearings. Uh, we do have Slava Vakarchuk, who uh, needs little introduction in Ukraine, but now globally he is becoming the voice of reformer. He's a member of parliament and, and founder of Holos Party. He was very active both in Orange Revolution and in Euromaidan. He is a rock singer activist, politician that really has a vision how to change Ukraine. We also have with us today Ambassador John Herbst, who is a very experienced career diplomat with almost 31 years experience in the diplomatic service, also an ambassador to Ukraine. He was there before William Taylor, 2003-2006. And last but not least, Adrian Karatnitsky, who is a, a, a watcher of Ukraine. He is frequently in Kyiv. He is a, a former president of Freedom House. Currently, he is the senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center. He keeps uh, 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 his hand on Ukraine's pulse and he understands really well both domestic and foreign policy. So I would like to start with uh, Minister Kuleba uh, explaining us what's new in Ukraine's negotiating position, what remains the same, and, and how Ukraine pl plans to achieve peace in Donbass. Over to you, Foreign Minister. Wow. That's uh, the question sounds ambitious. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, with you today, or this still morning, I guess, in the United States. It's an honor to have this discussion with uh, former ambassadors to the uh, to Ukraine, with uh, Sviatoslav, who is uh, one of the political leaders in Ukraine, and with distinguished experts. Uh, Honestly speaking, uh, I do not observe major changes in uh, our policy towards Russia, and uh, nor do I observe any major changes in Russian policy towards Ukraine. I think we are still uh, uh, 
discussing the same issues as we used to discuss since 2014. I think that the main narratives are uh, still in place. Russia insists now that it is not a party to the conflict with uh, the same level of vigor and uh, assertiveness as it did so in 2014. Russia calls on Ukraine to engage in direct dialogue with so with so-called Lugansk and Donetsk uh, People's Republics, as it has been doing since 2014. Uh, so uh, these things are still there. And on our side, uh, we uh, do not engage in direct dialogue with uh, the entities I mentioned. We insist that trilateral contact group is deliberately called trilateral because it consists of Ukraine, Russia, and OEC. And of course, we consider Russia as party to the conflict and not as a mediator or facilitator or in any other capacity. However, uh, at the same time, uh, we uh, engage with Russia on the such issues as release of uh, prisoners or exchange of prisoners, whatever term we may use here, and on disengagement along the front line. And if we manage, if we manage to build trust uh, between two parties, Russia and Ukraine, uh, in these spheres, we can move further and try to uh, unlock other issues which are on the agenda. So that's where we seem to stand uh, at the moment. Uh, there are many emotions, many concerns. Uh, you know, negotiating with Russia is like walking a minefield. You never know where it will blow up. Uh, so reactions and counter reactions uh, from all corners uh, are, can be easily understood. But uh, main lines of our policy and uh, our approach to settling this conflict remains absolutely unchanged. Did I miss anything? Did you ask anything more? Sorry. No, if, if you would like, if, if you're okay, if you don't have any other kind of introductory remarks that you would like to make, I would like to follow up a little bit with this, with a question, like you've mentioned that the narratives and the policies remain the same. Um, and Russia's strategic objectives towards Ukraine remain the same. So how can Ukrainian diplomacy, Ukrainian foreign service work towards nudging Russia's position? Because we all know Ukrainians would like to have and believe that the only way to have peace in Ukraine, it has to be a negotiated outcome. In this you know, world that is now affected by pandemic, uh, the way Russia is trying to use the pandemic to both undermine Ukraine from inside, but also put a question on sanctions as a humanitarian issue. Uh, do you find it more complicated to maintain solidarity of uh, Western allies on uh, this front or uh, 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 support to Ukraine and solidarity with Ukraine remains unchanged also on Western front? Well, uh, when it comes to solidarity, the situation is always uh, the same. Uh, it doesn't matter how strong uh, the solidarity you enjoy, you always want more. And I think this is uh, part of uh, a political reality for any country. Um, we, what makes me uh, confident that we can still count on solidarity is actually the sequence of uh, recent events uh, in the European Union and uh, in the United Nations where uh, a number of countries led the effort to uh, prevent Russia from adopting uh, the declaration initiated uh, uh, by it uh, with a noble title uh, to like a solidarity of nations to combat uh, COVID-19 but with a very specific paragraph in the text calling for easing uh, sanctions or lifting them on so-called humanitarian grounds. Uh, so you, you, know, you test solidarity and friendship and partnership in action. And that was a good test. 
And we registered uh, the support coming from the United States, the strong position voiced by the uh, European Union, uh, by uh, High Representative Borrell, uh, clearly saying that uh, sanctions imposed in response to violation of human rights and international law have nothing to do with humanitarian grounds. So this was a good test for this solidarity. And as far as I can uh, conclude from the events of last week, the solidarity is there. Everything else is a matter of uh, diplomacy, negotiations, finding striking balances, and uh, engaging uh, actors, uh, relative actors uh, in the game. Uh, thank you for answering that. And I would like to push you a little bit more on this consultative council because uh, it was a protocol signed during the trilateral me uh, group in Minsk. It caused quite a lot of anxiety internally in Ukraine. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what is, the, what is the added value of having such a body and how can it contribute to conflict resolution? The opponents of this would argue that it's kind of playing into exactly those Russian narratives and pushing Ukraine to recognize, legitimize uh, quasi authorities, Russian basically proxy groups. And did you hear any feedback from uh, Ukraine's partners in the Normandy format on this consultative council? Because they also, according to this protocol, are supposed to delegate their representatives. Thank you. In my one month in office uh, as, as foreign minister, I have been pushed uh, a little bit further on the issue of consultative council so many times that, uh, you know, it almost causes no reaction uh, in me when you push me again. Uh, this, is, uh, this issue has a lot of uh, broad, uh, received a lot of attention. Uh, the idea of consultative council came to life less in less than a week since my appointment. So I was not standing at the kind of origins of this, uh, of this idea, of this initiative. I had to face it as a reality. Uh, I think there is uh, there are two points which have to be which have to be taken into account. First, as I said, Ukraine will insist on the current structure of the trilateral contact group, and this contact this trilateral contact group consists of three actors: Russia, Ukraine, OEC. Everything else is a matter for uh, internal structuring but we will not uh, inside within the uh, contact group, but we are not looking, we are not seeking direct dialogue with uh, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, but we have to engage uh, and talk with them to implement on only specific set of issues to uh, implement uh, uh, certain points of the Minsk agreement. The idea of the Consultative Council is that we do not engage with uh, uh, representatives of so-called uh, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, but we make our societies talk and engage with each other. And point two that I want to raise is to mention is that uh, whatever any kind of change happening on Minsk track is taking with anxiety. Because as I mentioned earlier in one of my responses, the level of trust is uh, running to zero. People do not trust. Public opinion has no trust in what's happening uh, on that track. And therefore, any uh, change or any try to, any attempt to moderate process in, the, in a slightly different way is taken with anxiety. And uh, I understand uh, uh, the, our public opinion that wanted more, exp that was looking for more explanations and for more arguments on why this uh, body is needed. And I understand, and I, and I equally understand our partners who uh, approached me in particular with uh, questions uh, asking for more details about this initiative and uh, seeking more explanations on the on the kind of sense of uh, uh, on the logic of uh, of this of this development. Uh, again, uh, we have to be. Our goal is very simple. We have to be uh, creative, and we have to look for solutions 
which do not allow uh, freezing the uh, the process taking place within Minsk format. Uh, we cannot put the situation on hold. If we allow that, we will lose time. We will, uh, and it will be extremely difficult to recharge batteries after they are dead. So we have to look for solutions. And this is the commitment that was uh, declared by the president, by President Zelensky, that he wants to end the war and he's ready to make steps forward. Uh, but these steps will not lead to crossing Ukraine's red lines. And that's also something that should be taken for granted. Thank you. I have a couple of questions that are coming through the Q&A chat. Uh, I will uh, uh, unfortunately only take those that are related to uh, for, uh, related to Donbass because I see some questions are related to why the foreign policy priorities. But unfortunately, this is not the, the topic of our discussion. Uh, but one of the questions that came related to um, the process, the Normandy and Minsk process, is uh, could you please speak about potential prisoner swaps scheduled for this weekend? Do you have any update or any uh, fresh information that you could share? Uh, it's uh, the most difficult part uh, is to talk about prisoners exchange because uh, the last thing I want to do is to put it at risk by any unnecessary comment or promise given publicly. Uh, the agreement on the exchange was reached yesterday. Uh, we uh, aim at uh, uh, welcoming our people back uh, before Easter, before Orthodox East Easter, to make it so it's next week. We know uh, what are the numbers from both sides. Uh, but I will not disclose them at this point simply because uh, we have to be very cautious since we talk about destinies, feelings and emotions of people. But for us, the release of uh, people and of persons and exchanges are top priority. Uh, because any war is first and foremost about human destinies and about lives and uh, sufferings uh, of our compatriots. So this will remain an absolute focus uh, for, uh, for the government to work on the release of prisoners. Thank you, Minister. I have uh, some, our audiences are coming back to, the, to more details on this consultative council and Ellie Crowley is asking, will Russia have any role other than observer on the cons on consultative council? Uh, well, first I have to tell you that uh, the issue of Consultative Council has not been discussed in the trilateral contact group since uh, early March, I think 11th of March, when uh, it uh, was, uh, when it had been discussed for the first time. So uh, for the time being, uh, the only thing that we have uh, related to the Consultative Council the only three things which we have related to the Consultative Council are first, uh, the paper, the working paper with the description of the Council uh, of uh, 11th of March, uh, a very heated discussion uh, of the Consultative Council in the Ukrainian society, uh, and uh, discussions and exchange of views on consultative council with our partners. Nothing has changed with regard to this, uh, uh, to this initiative since the beginning of March and what is written in the paper that has become, that became available to the public. Uh, and no one knows what will be the final version of the consultative council, if any in the end, after all the rounds of negotiations. Well, I understand that both our international partners and Ukrainian society will be closely watching the, how this process evolves. I think you still have about 10 minutes with us from what I was informed. And I would like to open actually to a panel uh, to Slava Vakarchuk and Adrian to ask questions to you, Minister. Maybe we'll start with Slava. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Uh, First of all, uh, once again, I'm very happy to be here. I hope I'll have an opportunity to talk later. But I have just a very simple question, and I would like uh, Mr. Ambassador to give me a simple answer. Uh, what is your personal attitude 
to the initiatives of the consultative council. Do you support it or you do, dis do you disagree with it as a person, as a diplomat, as a Ukrainian citizen? Thank you. Thank you, Slava. Since you referred to ambassador, I think you have to specify which of ambassadors are you asking. No, okay. Just, it was not a joke. I just mean that you have an experience to be a diplomat and ambassador, and and so you are, you understand. Uh, you 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 are more than just a politician. Although today uh, you are a political appointee, but I ask you a direct question, and I want if you can give me a direct answer, your personal opinion. Never expect direct answers from diplomats. I think that's kind of a rule of our profession. But uh, the answer is very simple. I will never, I will never agree as minister to a direct dialogue between uh, uh, Ukrainian officials and the so-called Donetsk and Lugansk uh, representatives. Everything else is the field or the space for the art of diplomacy. But there are certain red lines which I will not cross as foreign minister or a citizen of Ukraine, and this is one of them. Thank you, Adrian, over to you. Yes, so there was a lot of controversy about this dialogue process with the Org Law uh, uh, attendant to the discussions and papers that were signed on March 11th. But the most controversial was that the, the documents were signed uh, by representatives of the Org Law in a protocol where they were referred to as plenipotentiary representatives of the or the law of the special regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. To my understanding, and if you can confirm it, was this the first time in any diplomatic relationship that Ukraine affixed its agreement to such terminology? And secondly, is it the position of Ukraine to start using this terminology in the future for those uh, participants on the, as advisors to the Russian side? And third, if it is not, uh, will you can you confirm that Ukraine will not sign any further documents or protocols in which these gentlemen are referred to as the plenipotentiary representatives? Uh, for me, as diplomat, uh, we can only speak about uh, about plenipotentiary ambassadors. That's uh, that's the issue. On the uh, issue of who and in which capacity will be signing uh, documents, I think we have to wait and to see which documents and how will be signed, if uh, any. Uh, at all uh, can be uh, arranged so within trilateral contact group. What I can what I can easily share with you right now is that uh, two meetings of trilateral contact group have already taken place uh, in the format of video conference, and uh, in this in all cases we never signed anything. Uh, and uh, the exchange of communication between. Uh, participants of these meetings is, uh, uh, take, is taking place in accordance with the practice established in previous years, which means that we do not communicate with each other. We send uh, communica our communications to the technical support unit of the Minsk group and the OEC uh, coordinates further communication. So uh, if I may remain a diplomat and provide you with this answer, then uh, I will appreciate if you accept it. Um, well, we'll have to accept it at this point. And I will uh, use the last four or five minutes that we have uh, for a question from David Kramer, another experienced diplomat and uh, an expert on Ukraine. Uh, in a way, it comes in a circle uh, for what, where we started. We do know that the keys to peace in Ukraine are in the Kremlin, lie in the Kremlin to a large extent. So. David is asking, do you see any indication to suggest that Putin is interested in resolving the war, withdrawing his forces from Ukrainian territory and respecting Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, especially in light of the pandemic situation? I think that uh, I believe that President Putin has no other choice but to withdraw from Ukraine, from Eastern Ukraine and from uh, Crimea as well. Everything else is just a matter of time. 
Well, thank you very much for being with us. I understand that you have some other duties to uh, go to. We will be continuing with the panel. It will be recorded so you can watch the rest of our conversation later on. And we hope you do. Thank you for your time. Uh, and I will move now um, to our next speaker. Uh, and I would like to um, ask uh, Ambassador Taylor, who has um, worked a lot in Ukraine uh, uh, and especially closely with President Zelensky during his time in Kiev. From your point of view, from the art of possible, how do you assess the strategy of Zelensky in dealing with Russia? And do you see any deviation from that course that you've seen in Ukraine or over the last year and during President Poroshenko, if you could compare a little bit? Do you see anything changes? with this consultative council? Uh, is there any worry that you have that perhaps Ukraine is falling into Putin's trap? Thank you, uh, Russia. I appreciate your question. I appreciate being here. <clears throat> I'm glad that the Institute of Peace can, can co-sponsor uh, this, this discussion. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity uh, last year to both see the president in his campaign, as well as in his first days in office, as well as when he put together the government and, and through the, the fall. Um, and I will say it, uh, that the goal remained the same. The goal was clear. Um, that was to end the war uh, on Ukrainian terms, uh, protecting the sovereignty of, uh, of the nation uh, within internationally recognized borders. That, that goal, um, was stated clearly during the campaign and was uh, adhered to um, uh, during the time that, that I observed. Um, in answer to your question, Rosa, um, it does seem to me um, that the president uh, and his team, which is, as we know, changed. There are a couple of changes uh, uh, over, over the, the months. Um, did change. Um, the, the tactics changed. The goal was the same, but it seemed to me that they were willing to try things. They were willing to experiment. Um, and these experimentations, some worked and some didn't work. Um, uh, we're aware of the flirtation with the Steinmeier formula. Not, not such a, a great idea. That, and several of us had conversations with the president uh, about that. Um, Disengagements. Uh, some of the disengagements um, uh, worked in some sense. That I'm thinking of the Luhanska Bridge, where that was able to be repaired and, and people could move across that bridge more easily. Um, old people, young people were able to uh, move that. Uh, so th that, was, that was important. Uh, uh, we've talked already about the prisoner releases. Um, the prisoner releases uh, uh, was a was a big deal. I remember the Saturday that the first batch uh, of, of uh, prisoners came back and the sailors. Uh, um, it was a spontaneous national holiday. So that experiment, uh, that work, uh, seemed to, uh, to to pay off. There have been other kinds of uh, experiments that uh, uh, that focused on humanitarian or people to people or uh, the, the ability of, of individual Ukrainians um, to, to live and prosper and uh, suffer less. And I'm thinking of some of the changes made at the at border crossings. I visited several of them uh, myself um, um, with the previous foreign minister and with the previous national security advisor, um, um, who I will say were very interested, as was the president, they told me, um, in the well-being of people on both sides of the line, both sides of the border crossings, and looking for ways to, to make those border crossings easier. I mentioned the bridge, but down in the border crossing with the temporary border crossing uh, from Kherson into Crimea, um, <clears throat> the, the requirement that uh, people had to walk for a, a kilometer and a half in the heat, this was during the summer, um, was a was real concern to uh, to this administration. So looking for ways to make lives of Ukrainians better in, in this seems to me um, uh, a, ch uh, a change, a focus. Um, you mentioned the consultative council. I would just say that one experiment that he that it seems to me that they have been trying, and this is an example of that, is talking to people on the other side. I think the foreign minister just mentioned they're not talking about talking to the representatives of the puppets of the LNR and DNR. 
um, no one should be talking to them. They're, they're uh, non-entities. But there are Ukrainians living um, in Orlo. Um, and there are Ukrainians that uh, sooner or later, we hope, will be reintegrated uh, into Ukraine. And so conversations with these people seem to me to, to make some sense. And that's an experiment that they can, uh, that they can usefully play. So I, uh, I think there have been some changes in tactics and some experiments. Some have worked, some have haven't. Um, but I look forward to seeing more of those. Do you want me there? Yeah, you're still there, John. Hey. I'm yeah. here. Good. Okay. Uh, we seem to have lost contact with our moderator, so I, I will ask the next question. Slava, you're, you're the leader of an important uh, opposition party which has been cooperating with President Zelensky, take on this development uh, in the Minsk negotiations. You'd be most welcome. <clears throat> First of all, I think that uh, the most important uh, promise uh, of the president was to end the war. But many people uh, in the country, in Ukraine, understood differently. And that was probably the biggest problem of the campaign of uh, President Zelensky, because he told so many things that could be broadly um, treated by different analysts or generally by the constituency. So when you say, I want to end the war, there is a question, uh, okay, but on whose conditions? So our party uh, is very strongly um, committed to the thing that uh, the only peace that Ukraine can achieve and need to achieve the, the peace by Ukrainian means, because sometimes you can achieve peace by the uh, enemy's means uh, and on their condition, and that can be actually, uh, that can lead to the end of your country per se. So uh, for us, it's absolutely unacceptable crossing these so-called red lines, and I'm very happy that uh, Minister Kuleba mentioned that red lines, but once again, you need to define these red lines and not just talking about red lines uh, as about vague uh, um, kind of definition, but to say what does it mean. And one of these red lines is suddenly that Ukrainian, uh, the war in, uh, in the east of Ukraine is not an internal conflict of Ukraine. It is a war imposed, orchestrated, and actually uh, um, uh, being, uh, you know, kind of uh, made by Russia. And uh, it is a war of Russia against Ukraine. And we treat it very, very straightforwardly. So this is red line we cannot cross. And what uh, worries me and worries a lot of other people, and actually it's not only about the Rolos or our you know, uh, supporters or our members of the party, but a lot of analysts we talked with, and all, a lot of you know, uh, people from civil society, all of them uh, uh, became very anxious and suspected this so-called consultative uh, council that it's gonna undermine uh, this kind of, um, the idea that Ukraine is talking with our enemy with the help of our two allies that are, let's say, our partners and help us to make this talk, which is a Normandy format. And actually this idea that we have so-called consultative uh, council, it really undermines and I'd say also dilutes the whole idea of this uh, four, four countries talking directly with each other. And I understand the point of many other people that they say that uh, the people from different parts of Ukraine, from our control by Ukraine party and from so-called low parties, uh, they need to talk. They may talk and they still talk. They have relatives. They have some, they, they go to see their relatives uh, our checkpoints are working uh, so they can be, you know, using their private uh, possibilities to see each other and to have this dialogue. And they, they are doing it. But political dialogue uh, between Ukraine uh, and uh, Kremlin puppets are unacceptable because that only will uh, make peace 
less achievable, not more achievable. Because the more we bring, uh, the more um, the more the more we put on the table initiatives that that divide Ukrainian society, the more difficult path to a, to a real peace uh, we can see. And in our opinion, the only strategy that we can use now is to make Russia stop uh, shooting. This is very clear, very simple, not very simply to achieve, but a very simple point. Just stop shooting first. And actually we have our plan, a uh, plan of, we call it the cold occupation. And I think that most of you know about this plan. And uh, the first and the most important point of this uh, plan is stop shooting. And stop shooting not for week or two, and not only on the points of engagement, but generally, for half a year or even more. And then we can see that both sides are ready to stop the war. And oft, only afterwards, we can go uh, further and we can talk about political points. We cannot talk about politics before we solve all defense issues. And this is one, the other problem of this consul so-called consultative um, uh, council, because they once again entangle political and defensive issues, which in our opinion is a very dangerous thing to do. And we cannot, one cannot be very naive and not be understand that Minsk agreements that actually Poroshenko's team signed literally on the barrel of a gun uh, five years ago uh, were uh, designed by, by Russia the way that uh, all defense and uh, security, sorry, security and and political issues were entangled with each other. Uh, the way that every next step of Ukrainian side will uh, weaken our position and will make our uh, sovereignty less, you know, robust and less stable. So our task today, instead of creating some, you know. Uh, initiatives that can divide Ukrainian society is to come up with a plan which is actually supported by the whole Ukrainian society. And this is the, the number one, number one thing that everybody in the country support, that we need to stop killing of our soldiers and our citizens. And this is the very simple thing. It's easier to say than to do, but that as, uh, in my opinion, what the president and his team, including Minister Kaleba, should be doing, persuading our partners in Normandy format, France and Germany, and our partners in uh, Budapest format, including uh, certainly the United States, that we all need to push Russia to stop fighting. And this is the only strategy that, in our opinion, can work and can bring to some you know, tangible results. All other things, including, you know, kind of trying to find, uh, with all my respect, you know, Ambassador Taylor, how much I respect and even love you, but with all my respect, all these other formats, uh, I think they only make things more complicated. Just, we need to put it simple, very simple, because all true, true things, all truth is simple. The truth is that Russia, and makes this war happen and they can stop it in one to push one button and it stop thank you slava i am back with you sorry i was uh, uh, for a minute disconnected i hope you can hear me well now uh, but there's a question also in the chat uh, from um, jonathan brunson who is asking well will the rada next vote on prov provisional special status uh, which it had extended, that expired at the end of uh, 2018. Are there any discussions? Is there any cross-party discussion inside the parliament on what are the modalities of the special status and how it will fit or not fit with the decentralization constitutional change? Thank you very much. Uh, so Holos, the position of Holos party is very clear. We voted strongly against this law and we will vote against any special status further. We think it's very dangerous to create some the idea of special status of Donbas because it is a threat to Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. Even if it's an, if it call if it is a temporary thing, uh, it's much 
our, our point is very simple. If you already have a temporary law, it's much easier to change it to a permanent one than to create a new one if there is none existing. And we think it's very dangerous to play with the, all these special statuses. Ukraine, by constitution, is a unitary country, uh, not a federal country. Uh, in our political system, we are only ready now to accept this country as a whole uh, territory where we have one constitution, one law, uh, one set of laws, and what the rules are the same for everybody. So suddenly there should be some special attitude, understanding that we actually have war and there is part of, of the country that we don't control. So we need to make a roadmap. And this roadmap, uh, actually we work on it, we talk with our parties, but once again, let me emphasize on the very simple thing that before there is a long lasting ceasefire, there should not be any serious political negotiations because they not only because they are uh, um, like bad for ukraine and for ukrainian future but also because they make things even more complicated let's first uh you know solve the problem of a ceasefire and once it is solved we can go further so this is our proposal and we will stand on it very firmly Thank you for answering that. So I'd like now to move to Adrian um, and ask him from his experience of seeing Ukraine with many, many different administration running the country. Uh, at, at the start of Zelensky's presidency, there were a lot of questions about his qualification, his team, whether he will be able to negotiate with Putin. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, concerns about whether he could be making some mistakes. Right now we have, uh, you know, a new uh, head of uh, president's office, Andriy Yermak, who is in charge, clearly, especially working with Kozak in the trilateral group. How do you assess they are handling this process? Are they making some mistakes or they are doing everything to defend Ukraine's national interest? I think that President Zelensky was the embodiment of the uh, sense of the Ukrainian people, which was a sense of hope, a sense of expectations, none of them grounded in the very difficult realities. Unrealistic expectations about how quickly you can change the court system and clean up corruption. Unrealistic expectations that it's only a personal will to build a relationship with the president of Russia that will open the door uh, to peace uh, uh, in the East. And I think he has uh, received a kind of an education over the course of the year. But I think that one of the weaknesses of his current style of operating is that the core group of people on whom he relies are still very narrowly based. He's not reached out to embrace in his core inner circle people who've had a long period of expertise, either in foreign affairs or in even domestic policy. These are mainly people from the entertainment industry or entertainment lawyers and so on. They may be smart people and they may have certain capacity to grow on the job, but in the absence of those kinds of trusted uh, seasoned advisors, uh, every president has had them, people like Volodymyr Harbulian or others, to whom you can turn to get a deeper insight into uh, geopolitics or domestic affairs, that is uh, sadly lacking. What is interesting is also that there was a kind of a scattershot approach in the selection of the people who created, made up the 254 vote majority in the Rada from the Servant of the People Party. But we've seen over the course of the last few months, the coalescing of people who got into that list on the basis of liberal pro-European policies and also patriotic policies and asserting a kind of an independence. So while it is now possible to say that there is no longer this super majority, there are situational majorities uh, inside the Rada. And I think that the emergence of this group of young uh, people, many of them Western educated, many of them active in anti-corruption civil society uh, efforts that made it into the servant group. They're the ones who were among the 65 or so who signed the initial document opposing the concessions uh, made on uh, March uh, 11th in Minsk. And I think that that is another very healthy, and if the president embraces these people as constructive partners rather than sees them as somehow disloyal, I think he will improve his performance and enrich uh, the performance of the administration. Uh, thanks, Adrian. There's, uh, there's a question here in the Q&A uh, section that um, 
in view of President Zelensky's desire to reintegrate Donbass, and he even speaks of safely reintegrating Donbass, because, you know, probably Kremlin's idea is to just shuffle Donbass back, back to make it destabilize Ukraine even further. But in that view, I mean, Bill Hamilton is asking, the war has consolidated and strengthened pro-Western Ukrainian national identity. Is there room for residents of the occupied territories in such a definition of Ukrainian identity? You're asking me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think there is room because Ukraine is a democracy and Ukraine would vote on the various approaches to language, to culture, to civilization. I don't think you can make compromises on behalf of the opinion of the public. Yes, minority rights have to be respected, but Ukraine, as has been uh, stated uh, uh, by, uh, by Slava Bakarachuk, is a unitary state. It has made that kind of a choice. I would add that Russia primarily is a unitary state except for the Tatar autonomy, and it tolerates no uh, breaching of that kind of a standard. So I think, you know, and what is the reality of Ukraine? Ukraine, when people, when different factions and different administrations have been in power. There has never been persecution of the people in the East. I think what is needed is a communications campaign to make the people of the Donbass remember that they were basically left alone and allowed to handle their own affairs. They had, in effect, decentralization, perhaps too much decentralization in the past, but there's never been the case that the Ukrainian centralized government has ever come and tried to impose uh, a, a national identity on them, uh, etc. I think, uh, you know, what we're dealing with is, a, is, is how to undo Russian propaganda propaganda and pro-Russian propaganda that has uh, been persistent over the course of six years and has made some inroads. And I think that is what the president is, is, is trying, uh, trying to do. So in my view, there is no compromise to be made. Ukraine is, the idea of reintegrating Donbass is not to put a part of Russia inside Ukraine. It's to put a, a specific part of Ukraine back into Ukraine, but operating under the general rules that are adjudicated in the democratic process through the Rada, through elections, and through the wisdom of its elected leaders. Thank you for answering this one. So now we'll, we'll move to Ambassador Herbst. Uh, of course, Ukraine cannot withstand Russian aggression on its own, but on the other hand, Russia cannot win against the United West. And these are the two pieces of the, you know, the same problem uh, that is important to keep in focus. United States has always been a strong ally of Ukraine in this uh, struggle against Russia with, you know, the impeachment hearings with Trump's presidency, with uh, Zelensky is in office right now. After all of this turmoil, would you say that the bipartisan support for Ukraine hold? And, um, you know, what is the impact of right now having no U.S. special representative for Ukraine? We do know that Kult Volker spent quite a lot of time shuffling, shuttling between the different European capitals, keeping everybody on the same page, consolidating positions. Uh, how would you assess the current uh, role of the United States in uh, helping resolve this conflict? Uh, first, it's important to recognize that despite the questions surrounding impeachment proceedings here, bipartisan support for Ukraine in Congress remains rock solid. It, it's worth pointing out that even as the impeachment hearings were underway, Congress agreed to um, restore or rather to maintain military assistance to Ukraine and even authorized increase of $50 million in military assistance. And during the impeachment proceedings, Congress voted punishing sanctions which have severely delayed, if not destroyed, Nord Stream 2. And I, I spent a lot of time consulting with staff in Congress. And I can tell you, Republicans and Democrats are firm in supporting Ukraine. Um, Kurt Volker performed a terrific service as a special envoy. He made clear to the whole world something that everyone watching this event knows, which is that the war in Donbass is a war of Kremlin aggression against Ukraine. It's not any kind of civil war inside of Ukraine. So from that standpoint, Kurt's departure is a loss. But foreign policy of the United States, even under President Trump, remains strongly supportive of Ukraine and pushing back against Kremlin aggression in Ukraine. Pompeo is excellent on this, as is Esper at the Department of Defense, as is O'Brien at the NSC. And um, lower levels of state with George Kent as the DAS, Philip Reeker as the acting assistant secretary, and Steve Began as the new Deputy Secretary of State understand this issue really well 
and they recognize that America has important interests in making sure that Kremlin aggression in Donbass is defeated. So I don't have any doubt that even with Kurt's departure, Ukraine is getting quality attention from Pompeo, from Esper, and their teams at the Defense Department and the State Department. Thank you, John. There's a question here from Michael Hritzak about, is there any chance that the trilateral contact group will eventually add another state representative or state representative, such as United States or other states providing military aid to Ukraine? There's been a lot of ideas floated in the way how Minsk could be or should be expanded, countries that were co-signatories of the Budapest Memorandum. Do we have all the tools to negotiate a deal? Uh, and it's just because Russia is, does not want to make any uh, change in its position? Or do we need to think about new diplomatic platforms, some revisions of the existing ones? Uh, what would you say? The Minsk process, uh, prior to uh, President Zelensky negotiating first the prisoner release last summer, and then President Zelensky having a successful summit in Paris, uh, produced nothing for Ukraine. The only serious talks on ending Kremlin aggression in Donbass have taken place between first Tory Nuland and Surkov, and then between Kurt Volker and Surkov. So while I think it would be nice if the U.S. participated in the Minsk process, I don't think it's essential. And I think that when the U.S. engages, um, Russia pays attention and offers quality ideas. Unfortunately, those quality ideas have not led to quality proposals and quality policies on the part of Mr. Putin in getting out of Ukraine. But I agree with Foreign Minister Kuleba that Russia will eventually leave Donbass and not in the very distant future. We're not talking about decades, we're talking about months or years. And eventually they will get out of Crimea, although that may take decades. And here's one more question to Ambassador Hurst. Is there a talk of appointing a new U.S. envoy on Ukraine? Um, I would not rule it out, but I do not expect it. And okay. while, again, Volker did a great job, you have very smart people paying attention to Ukraine in the State Department who are performing Volker's functions without those jobs. So Riker and Kent, and for that matter, David Hale, the Undersecretary of State, have been in touch with the French and the German representatives so that we are coordinating. And uh, others in the department may take over this function. Thank you. I'll take another question and, and direct it to Ambassador Taylor from Beirut's Legarto. Assuming that Ukraine's negotiating position has not changed, uh, and considering the key, if not dominant, role of Russia in this peace process, what would compel Russia to leave Ukraine? <clears throat> I agree with uh, Ambassador Herbst uh, that the Russians will leave uh, Donbass um, in the <clears throat> nearer future, um, and they'll be inclined to that. I believe they are inclined to that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, this is a loser for them. This does not uh, bring them benefits. Their their role, their soldiers uh, in Donbas. This is this does not bring them benefits. It's only brought them pain and costs. The costs are in the form of sanctions. The sanctions hurt. The sanctions uh, a, a percent of GDP a year. This is serious. This is serious pain uh, that, that they are enduring. <clears throat> now they have the problem of the virus, uh, which they have to, to deal with, and that's going to bring on the economic problems that that are exacerbated by the sanctions. So. <clears throat> they are looking at big problems and they'll look for a way out. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to bring in Slava with the following question. Um, there's a, there's, in some experts, countries like Ukraine or Moldova are called in between states. And the question is whether it would be acceptable for a country like Ukraine, that some people see as in between state between Russia and the European Union, to uh, embrace the neutrality status and to continue economic, social, and cultural integration towards the West without, for example, NATO membership. Would that de-escalate the conflict? Would that be acceptable for Russia? And what would you say as, as Ukrainian to such proposition? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this question. First of all, I think uh, there is no pattern that Ukraine can use because every example in the world's history is unique. 
Uh, there are our neighbors uh, of a former Soviet bloc, like Poland or Baltic countries, that were very successful in a quick, in the quick path to all European institutions, including NATO and European Union. There was a question. There was a famous example, which some uh, some uh, some experts now bring on the table. The fin <clears throat> Finland's uh, example. Uh, we all know how difficult was was uh, Finland's history, especially in the relationship with Russia and the former Soviet Union, uh, starting with the war in 1940, especially starting with being a colony of Russian Empire, and then the war of 1940, 1941, and then uh, they ended up uh, first winning, then formally losing the war and losing a big bulk of territory and becoming a neutral country. Uh, but actually staying an independent nations and managing to build a big prosperous society. I think Ukrainian example is unique. Uh, we are not in a position of Poland or Baltic countries today. We actually, we could have used this path, I think. I strongly believe we could have used this path in 90s and the beginning of 2000s. But the politicians, former politicians, were much more in Ukraine, much more preoccupied with, you know, filling their pockets with, with dollars than with bringing Ukraine in, uh, closer to West, not only in words, but in their deeds. And it's actually something that I think it was a wasted time to some extent. And today, I don't think we are the privilege of Poland or Baltic countries of the 90s. But still, I think our path is uh, uh, close integration with all European institutions and especially defense umbrella, which NATO is. I totally understand. I'm not a naive person. I don't think that that Rome wasn't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you cannot do this in one day. But I still think that this is a roadmap or at least a start for, for us, a compass that we need to use both because this is the only alternative for Ukraine uh, to stand against very strong and unfortunately aggressive neighbor that we have uh, next to us, but also because uh, as we see from the, from the 90s, that uh, the integration uh, and the roadmap of and then generally the process of integration into both NATO and EU gives a lot of benefit to, to the nation. And that's why I think that for what Ukraine needs to do now is first uh, strongly claim our North Atlantic and European, um, let's say, uh, uh, our uh, our desire to uh, to, to uh, follow this path. Second, not waiting for you know kind of. Uh, like, guarantees or something, but just doing our job and making our army stronger, making the standards of our army closer to NATO, building a, pro, uh, a strong and independent and not corrupt court system, uh, making this uh, country where there is a rule of law, bringing foreign investment, all these kind of things, all our home tasks. We need to do it, whatever they say in Brussels or Washington, day by day, day by day. And I think the more we succeed, the more we, uh, our efforts are, are uh, resultative, the easier for us will be to persuade our partners that it's a worthwhile, worthwhile game for them to bring Ukraine closer and to make it member of this both respected and very important clubs, which EU and NATO are. In my personal opinion, their security uh, kind of club, uh, security umbrella is even more important for Ukraine today. Uh, okay. And in this and in this particular case, you having here uh, two wonderful people for, uh, who were ambassadors of Ukraine and represented United States, I want to stay here in this company that I think uh, the, the role of United, the United States may be very, very important in this particular, um, uh, in this uh, in this scenario. And I think that uh, it, is, it is of great importance that the United States continue to uh, have a strong uh, 
had a strong say both in uh, regulation of conflict uh, in the, of war in Donbas and also in generally in making Ukrainian positions, uh, let's say, uh, more successful now. Thank you, Slava. And Adrian would like to add, he, he noted me on, on, the, on this question. Go ahead, Adrian. I think there's a fundamental difference between, say, what happened with Finland and its pursuit of neutrality. Russia or the Soviet Union had territorial pretensions on Finland, but Mr. Putin has ethno-national pretensions on Ukraine. He isn't I, as interested in the territory. He is interested in saying that the people of Ukraine are actually the Russian people, and so potentially subject to both his sphere of influence and his sphere of dominance and potentially uh, of participants in a unitary state. And so when we discuss the prospects for peace, what we really have to deal with is the reality that Mr. Putin does not want the existence of either the Ukrainian people or the Ukrainian state. And what we need to do is to find the types of mechanisms that will constrain him until over time different leaders uh, find different solutions uh, uh, in Russia. I Thank couldn't you. agree more. Couldn't okay. agree more. Good, we have agreement here. And also there's a shifting public opinion inside Ukraine for how it sees its security and uh, support for NATO membership has increased dramatically since Russian aggression on Ukraine. And that's important because why Ukraine is also not Russia is public opinion matters. And uh, Slava knows that as politician, you have to listen to Ukrainian citizens and act upon a uh, very important change in public opinion that happens, especially around NATO. Uh, I have a question. I will, will take a few more questions. One, um, no, two. Okay, and, sorry uh, to interrupt you, uh, but you know, you know that the majority of Ukrainians support uh, the idea that Ukraine can join NATO now. It's probably the first time in, in 30 years of our history. Exactly. Uh, um, so Tatiana Voroshko is asking, I would like to direct it to John Herbst about, are there any indicators that the US military and other assistance to Ukraine might be affected by COVID-19 pandemic and the stress it puts on the US economy? Is there any risk that it may decrease? Oh, uh, the short answer to that is no. Uh, again, I, I, I'm having four or five meetings a week with staffers from Congress. And I can tell you, again, Republicans and Democrats are strongly interested, even in the age of coronavirus, in our policy towards Ukraine, supporting Ukraine against Kremlin aggression, and our policy towards Russia, making sure Russia pays a price for its aggression in Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, you know, in these very interesting times, I can't rule out someone proposing to limit foreign assistance, foreign military assistance. But even if that conversation begins, I don't think it will affect American military assistance to Ukraine or economic assistance. Um, Besta Taylor, this one is uh, from Denis uh, Yassishin about, can we expect tougher sanctions on Russia? And uh, in a way, what, what may prompt tougher sanctions on Russia from the United States side? If the Russians were to uh, invade further, if the Russians were to send more troops, if the Russians were to violate the borders, if the Russians were to send their proxies uh, um, into other parts of Donbas, uh, that is, if the Russians were to exacerbate the situation, I think, yes, uh, uh, that it would be possible for the reasons that Ambassador Herb said. There is strong support in our Congress um, for these kinds of sanctions, and they have been the Congress has been very clear about this. And that kind of uh, aggressive behavior on the part of the Russians uh, would prompt more uh, sanctions, I believe. Uh, and maybe we'll take this last question to all of the panelists, because it's uh, interesting to hear your views from Vasil Babic, who is asking, UN peacekeeping mission in Donbass was proposed by Poroshenko's administration. This proposal has not yet been picked up by Zelensky's administration. Do you think there's still a room to make the UN peacekeeping mission a reality? What are crucial pros and cons of such mission? Maybe we'll start with Adrian and then go in that order. Well, again, I think all of these are path dependent and they're only a realistic if Mr. Putin is interested in um, um, coming to a deal. I don't believe he is. So I think that this is uh, a non-starter. Ambassador Taylor? So I disagree with Adrian. I think, as I said earlier, um, I think Mr. Putin does want to get out of Donbass, and I think an international peacekeeping force authorized by, but not run by, the Security Council um, is, is a real option. 
Slava? Is your party uh, promoting the idea of the peacekeeping mission? Uh, our party is promoting our plan, which I will be ready to share with everybody who still haven't read it. And certainly uh, one of the, well, the items of this plan, but not the first one, uh, is suddenly the possibility of bringing some peacekeeping mission, uh, should it be UN mission or OSC mission, but suddenly there should be some uh, um, intermediate um, uh, mission with international mandate before Ukraine gets this territory back fully, because you need this part. So we, uh, we support the idea that should be some uh, international made it for that mission. But first, once again, I, I will state it once again, it should be a long lasting ceasefire. Before that happens, nothing else is ever possible. Yes, there needs to be peace to, to be kept in the first place, in a way. Yeah. Ambassador Herbst. Um, I'm somewhere in between Bill and Adrian. <laughs> uh, I believe that Mr. Putin has does not see a need at the present time to leave Donbass. Uh, but I believe that there are thoughtful people in Russia who understands, as Bill said, that Moscow's excellent adventure in Ukraine has been a disaster for them. Uh, it's hurt their economy. Uh, it's hurt their international position. And eventually they'll have to leave. Uh, when that day comes, the whole concept of an international peacekeeping mission may provide a cover for Mr. Putin to get out with a shred of dignity. I'm happy to give him all the dignity he wants as long as he gets the you-know-what out of Donbass. Nancy's war there. Yes, I see the rising hands of Slava, please. Just one very important thing. Uh, one of the other days, I mean, recently, Russian authorities, I think it was Putin himself, who raised this question that today during the pandemic, coronavirus, everybody should, uh, let's say, put a quarantine, quarantine on, on sanctions for other countries because that's you know, weakens their economy and that's not the time, time for the sanctions. I think this is absolutely unacceptable. And I think, I hope and uh, that our partners in all countries, uh, including the United States, understand that. Because Russia was, the sanctions were imposed on Russia not because of pandemic or something like that, but because of, of their cruel uh, violation of international order. And so I think that connection or playing on feelings of, uh, of uh, you know of countries who are hit hard by coronavirus uh, pandemic now is absolutely unacceptable. It's very cynical. It's very manipulative. And we need to strong strongly stand against it. Thank you very much. I think we will be wrapping up our conversation today. We still have quite a lot of questions, but obviously it's normal. We had almost 140, 163 participants uh, in joining us today in this conversation. Um, I think sometimes in politics and in life, the most difficult is to do nothing. In a way, from this conversation, what I understand is that, you know, Zelensky has to persevere in keeping the front lines of Ukraine defended, is to maintaining this uh, uh, resilience of the country and keeping unity, which is so important for Ukraine to overcoming this aggression. There's still a lot to do for Ukraine's diplomacy and Ukrainians are putting a lot of hopes uh, on the foreign minister and his team. Obviously, they are not favoring the military scenario, regardless of all the disinformation and warmongering of, of, of Russia about, um, about Ukraine. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank everybody for joining today. I cannot say join me in the round of applause, but you can clap whenever you are, you know, uh, to all the speakers. I think it's been very informative. Um, perhaps uh, uh, this time Chatham House would uh, take a button from the Atlantic Council and continue this conversation on Donbass. So we have something in the pipeline where we'll, we'll share with everybody the information. But thank you, Atlantic Council, for having such a star panel for all your insights wishing all the happy easter who are celebrating this weekend and those uh, who are celebrating next one thank you for joining us and um have a nice evening and stay at home stay at home save lives i will not continue because the rest is very british <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much thank you bye-bye